Hello. Okay, let me use this one then. Okay. Um, thanks a lot for uh, joining us tonight for I Testify by Watch and Walk Through It. Um, my name is Ebenezer. Um, I have the humbling honor of leading this ministry here. Uh, I was hoping that my wife would be here by now, but she's not here, so it's kind of got me a bit nervous. But yeah, we, we, we've been doing Watch and Walk for about 10 years now, and we started back home in my home country, doing some of these things. And about three years ago, uh, we started thinking about the possibility of replicating that. And one friend of mine here, um, Eric Amuzu, right there, he was my roommate then. He kind of encouraged me a lot. God used him a lot and told me that um, I shouldn't just be about studies and academic work, but I should think of replicating some of these things over here. And by God's grace, it's, it's been a good journey. Uh, would I testify by watch and walk? This is actually the fourth time we are doing it in Waco. But it's the first time we are doing it in Truett. Um, we started it somewhere in 2019. We've done um, about three programs. We did a couple of them at, um, I, I think about three of them, and two or so of, the, of, the, of them at um, Quadrangle Community um, Room. And it was, it was a good time. So the whole idea behind I Testify is to just create an opportunity for people to worship God and uh, hear exaltation, hear um, testimonies, and just be encouraged um, through the spoken, um, I mean, creative arts, like spoken word, uh, choreography, uh, painting, and the rest. So that is what uh, we've been doing uh, for some time now. And uh, today we have the opportunity to do that through spoken word, um, through music. And as you can see, the theme is faith, hope, and love. Okay, and in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, when Paul was talking about love, he said that the greater, I mean, these three remain, uh, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Um, but then I would argue that in this current season, it's not just love, which is the greatest of these right now. We need all these three to be able to bear when some witness to the gospel. And I would even argue that without faith and hope, your ability to express the love of God will be very difficult, uh, will be hindered. And so that is what we, we, want, we, want, we want to do today, taking you on a journey to express the love of God, the faith that you should be able to have, and then the hope that you should be able to have in Christ. Just express that to you in many ways, through songs, uh, through spoken word. But also we want to encourage you that as you listen, you just participate. Um, especially with the songs, just respond in worship. Uh, with the spoken word, receive it. And um, our worship leader here will just be giving um, direction on that. But just not, don't be uh, a spectator because our testify is really about experiencing God in many ways. And my prayer is that you take great things away from our administration uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, without much ado, I'm just going to um, say the uh, opening prayer for us. And then after that, uh, our worship team will take it from there. And as I said, it's going to be a journey. There's not going to be any interruption as soon as I end, from beginning to end. But just um, just get connected with the flow. And um, I'm trusting that God would uh, use this opportunity to, be, uh, to, make, to just edify you and make you a blessing as well. Amen. Shall we bow down and pray? In Jesus' name, Lord, we bless you for this... Um, evening we give you all the glory we give you adoration we give you all the praises for this time we thank you for the gift of faith we thank you for the gift of hope and we thank you for the gift of love um, we are praying in the name of Jesus that as we are about to move into this program you will take control you will lead um, this time just have your way um, transform us edify us convict us encourage us and help us to become encouragers uh, may your name be exalted now forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we begin in worship? I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me in all my days. 
I am held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life And all my life you have been your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Darkest nights, it weaves through the pits and valleys, 
It places a flag on the mountaintop where hopes and dreams reside, no longer wearing the mask that grins and lies, that shades our cheeks and shades our eyes. We hear the alarm, the ringing of his call. Awake, awake, O Zion. We grab strength and splendor from our closet, no longer captive. We shake the dust off, no holding back, no longer afraid. For your love has set us free. Because, Lord, your love is like the sunshine that shines through the darkest nights. It weaves through the pits and valleys. It places its flag on the mountaintop where dreams and hope reside. Because no one is like you, Lord, our Prince of Peace, my Almighty, our Omega, my Alpha, our Savior, our everything. Your love is like the sunshine that shines through the darkest nights. It weaves through the pits and valleys. It places its flag on the mountaintops where hopes and dreams reside. Lord, your love is amazing. Would you stand as we sing of God's love? Oh, I've got a friend closer than a brother. There is no judgment. Oh, how he loves me. I've got a friend. He's my strength. He is my strength. My portion. He is my portion. With me in the valley. With me in the fire. With me in the storm. Let all my life tell.
What do you do when your well comes up empty? When you've prayed every prayer you can think of and still everything is the same? What do you do when you forget how to pray? When the cracks of earth are too gaping to ignore but it keeps spinning anyway, what then? There's a kind of silence that is holy and a kind of holy that is silent, but what do you do on the silent days that are too much to bear? When you hold the child whose dad might not live, when your own child did not live, when society presses against its very seams and life seems like nothing like you thought it'd be two years ago, what then? When there is war and rumors of war and you realize your hands will never be big enough to hold all of the pain you want to heal, when doubt feels more real than the faith you're clinging to, what then? When you've pleaded mercy for Lot and interceded like Daniel and believed like Elijah, but the desert is vast and it is not time. Hope is a dangerously vulnerable thing. It holds the hand of suffering. It honors it, names it, points it home. Hope is the bleeding woman who risked shame to reach for Jesus. Hope tastes like desperation. It knows a kind of beauty only the bandaged ones know. Hope reminds us that while evil may triumph temporarily, nothing here is an ending. Suffering reminds us that while it can feel like we are living in a shack, we belong where the grass is green and the waters are still in the feasting hall of our Father who has been present for every tear. Because he came down to us in the valley that passes as close as the shadow of death, we trust he holds us still, bears with us till hope will no longer be needed. For one day, all we have believed in faith will be before us at last. Advent will pass, and all that is wrong will be made right. What do you do when your well come up, comes up empty? When you cannot familiar, remember the familiar sound of your own same name, you call on the one who named you. When the world fractures into a thousand pieces that may never mend this side of heaven, and the way forward is not clear, Remember, we are the wilderness narrative, free but not yet home. We hope, we wait, we refuse to be shaken from the foundation of our faith. Hope came down to us that we might not live in despair. What do you do when it all shatters dark? What's the alternative? We turn towards the light. We are a believing people who will trust what our eyes cannot yet see. Our wounds are sutured by the splinters in his hands. Our sins are forgiven by God's grace to man, and we're not alone. Though you have suffered, your Savior stands beside you, restoring you even now, even here. Even these present bodies remind us of his body. Community is our safe place to land when we ourselves cannot remember how to stand, so lift your weary eyes. Who knows, tomorrow may be the same, or better or worse, but his presence is a present for our present, and we are not alone. You're not alone. So, return to his love and drink deeply. Cling to his hope. For all this, it's but a glimpse of home. Yes, 
a word we stitch onto thousands of t-shirts and reserve as a name for our children. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we cannot see. It is strong conviction and deep belief. In faith, there is certainty that although life hits like the harshest waves of the sea, Yahweh is in control. In faith, there is certainty that Jesus will come once more. In faith, there is certainty that although life is full of the temporary, we have access to a wonderful forever. In faith, there is certainty that our eternal home is wherever God is. But allow me to pull back the curtain of blind positivity. There are those who in the private boxing ring of their mind deal with a faith that seems to shrug at hope. They deal with a faith where skepticism seems to bang and scratch the window of trust. And then there are those who have fallen into the trap of anxiously comparing their faith to the faith of the faithful they know. Wow. Fallen into the trap of anxiously comparing their faith with the faithful of, that they know. what it must be like to assume that your faith is dead in the company of those whose faith constantly seems alive. Maybe, just maybe, we need to stop and ask ourselves, who and what is my faith in? Faith allows us to release confidence in what we know and put it into the one who died so we could live. It is faith that guides us into faithfulness. It isn't faux faith that publicly shouts God is in control and privately whispers, God sits on the throne only when I move over to give him the seat. Sincere faith is firm ground. Attempting to craft a faith outside of intimacy with God will always leave you burdened by a man-made version that neither feels safe nor secure. Cling to faith. Hold on to faith even as pride tries to falsely convince you that you hold the title's way maker and problem solver. Hold on to faith, even as chaos knocks you out of comfort. Hold on to faith, even as the outside world screams for you to let go. Hold on to faith, even as others exit belief. Hold on to faith. That's what I had to do during this spoken word, is hold on to faith. As I sat down to write and my mind kept falling into this blank state, God sat down with me. I pushed across the three things I knew. The sky is blue and the grass is green and the sun is in harmony with the moon. To me, he gave back. I, Abba, will always be with you. Great is thy 
faith, hope, and love. These uh, values, these virtues, these spiritual disciplines uh, have been beautifully expressed to us uh, this evening. They've been inspiringly exemplified and modeled to us. And we've been encouraged and exhorted uh, in these stories of, of these great long-term values from the scriptures. Uh, my uh, charge uh, this evening is to kind of summarize what we've heard, uh, to uh, leave us with the bow tie, if you will, and the plan is to do that very briefly. Uh, I, being 55 years old, I don't have the rhythmic and the literary eloquence of our students here, but I can't testify. And so that's kind of my hope and my uh, plan for our time, uh, my time with you. So my testimony for tonight starts in 2001, and that's when I became a student at uh, Truett Seminary. And uh, maybe some of y'all were very young, maybe some of y'all weren't even born then, but uh, that was when my journey at this institution started. Uh, in 2001, I had started a new job at Bailey University. Uh, and also in 2001, uh, my wife Tanya, who's here with me in the back, uh, she uh, had given birth to the fourth of our five children. Her name was Faith. Uh, in 2001, uh, shortly after Faith's birth, uh, she started having some complications, had to go back into the hospital, spend some time in the what we call the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, later on, we found out glad I didn't know at the time, uh, but we were pretty close to losing her. Uh, but by the grace of God, we didn't, and she is thriving now, and uh, she's a college sophomore. Uh, in 2001, in that same year, through the difficulties of Faith's birth and lots of the challenge and stress, my wife Tanya began to have some challenges of her own in the health area. Um, people call it postpartum depression. Some people call it the baby blues. Uh, for many people, it's a very strange uh, challenge, and if you haven't experienced it or have been close to someone that's experiencing it, you don't really realize it, but uh, if you have, you know it's a very real and very intense struggle. Uh, and she went through that for about uh, nine months in uh, 2001. And on top of all that, we had uh, a series of financial challenges. Uh, I was joyfully and thankfully accepted into Truett Seminary, and my wife and I had discussed that and discerned the, the Lord's will with, for me at that time was to pursue seminary education. Uh, but in that discernment process, we also felt like God had encouraged us to trust and have faith in him for our provision for that. And so uh, we committed to come to Truett Seminary and pursue this education and do that without taking out any loans and to do that in a debt-free manner. And so that created some financial challenges uh, for us or some financial opportunities, maybe you can see it that way. And during that time, I also was uh, by vocation. I was serving at a local church here in town. So you can see I probably had a little bit to do. Uh, and so we had some family challenges. And we had some financial obstacles. And we had some schedule difficulties. But by the grace of God, in 2004, uh, I was able to graduate from uh, Truett and get my uh, Master of Divinity degree. And it was a debt free. Now, I share that story. Yeah, you can. I share that uh, because it matters to what we've been talking about uh, this evening. Uh, I share that to say that though there were many uh, obstacles, there were many difficulties, there were many times that I didn't know that I would be able to complete the degree, there were many threats to the completion of the vision that we had, there were many challenges, but by the grace of God, my wife and I, we were able to remain faithful to what God called us to. 1 Corinthians 13, uh, Ebenezer mentioned it at the beginning, says faith, hope, and love. These three, and it says they remain. These virtues, they remain, they are needful. He said we, we need uh, faith and hope to, to love well. We need love and hope to have faith. We, we need these. But it says also in the passage, they, they remain. And that's kind of what I really want to talk to you all about, Re remain. We were able to remain. We were able to persevere. We were able to persist. We were able to stay steadfast to the completion 
of what we felt like God called us to. And that was Paul's uh, admonishment uh, to the Corinthian believers. And you probably all know the history. Uh, Paul was in affirming in this letter to the church at Corinth. He was affirming their faith. They, they had faith. And so he was affirming it. And he was also guiding them in the journey of the development of his church. And he was also reminding them that they needed to remain. They needed to persevere. They needed to be faithfully steadfast to what he had called them to do because they had faced uh, many of their own challenges. Uh, this church at Corinth was a flourishing church. I mean, it was a, a big, bustling church in a metropolitan community, and, and it was thriving and having an impact in the culture of its day. But also, they had lots of obstacles that were threatening their existence. They had cultural challenges that they were dealing with, uh, they had doctrinal disputes and issues that they were working through. There was all kinds of relational tensions that they were trying to process. Many things that would uh, challenge them not to remain faithful to Jesus and to the call that he had to them, but they were able to. And so that's a witness, uh, a testimony for them, and that's a witness to us to be faithful uh, in that which God has called us to. Now, uh, Paul also uses these same three vows and admonishments to the church at Thessalonica. And I want to read that to us uh, this evening. This is 1 Thessalonians chest, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 say this. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, and your labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. He's uh, encouraging this church is similar to the way that he was encouraging the Corinthians. But what I like about this passage and why I added uh, to our text tonight is because it gives a little bit of the how. I think we're, I'm not telling you anything you don't know that we need to remain, we need to be faithful, we need to be steadfast. But he gives a little bit of help here how, what it looks like. Uh, he says here, he talked about the work of faith. I'm so glad, part of my testimony is that over and over and over again, God does the work for us. He calls us to something, but he actually does the heavy lifting himself. But because of his great love for us, he invites us to kind of partner along with him. But our part of it, the work, our part of the partnership is that we get to believe. That's our work. He says, your work, he says, so our work, our energy, our labor is to believe. Yeah. He actually makes the ministry go. He actually creates salvation for people. He actually brings deliverance and freedom. We just get to believe with him. In our journey, uh, I said earlier, uh, for Tanya and I, for seminary, uh, we had to just keep believing again and again and again. Uh, I had all planned out. You know, I was going to write for scholarships, and I got the seminary uh, encyclopedia and wrote off it and never got a single of the scholarships that I applied for. So my plan, my, my efforts just seemed to fail. So they're kind of like, oh, my goodness, how, what, are, how, what are we going to do? But I never felt freedom from God to kind of back out of the deal. I, we just kept, for four years, we kept feeling like God just said, well, just keep believing. Keep trusting. So we just kept moving forward, and it felt very unstable. It felt very scary at times, and I felt very insecure at times. But we kept believing. Our work was to believe, and so we believed, and we believed, and we believed. And one semester there was no money, but we believed. And and literally, one day I came home from work, and in my mailbox was a big fat envelope of money. And another semester, there was no money, and we believed, and we believed, and we believed, and I got a letter saying, hey, if you don't pay by Friday, your class is going to be canceled. So I went to the financial aid department to plead and say, well, I get paid on Friday. I'll just give you my check if you just give me a few more days. And so I walked into the office, and I sat down with the lady, and, and, and I, I don't know what I sounded like, but I was just trying to mumble and saying, if you just give me till Friday, if you just do something, don't cancel my classes. And, and she just kind of stopped me, and she said, okay, okay, okay. What's your student number? And so I gave her the student number, and she typed to me, and she looked up and said, well, you're good. 
and I didn't ask any questions. I just got up and walked out. I don't know what happened. I don't know. I just know she said I was good, and that was enough for me. I don't want to know no more. And then another semester, there was no money, and then somehow all those scholarships I wrote off for, none of them, I never, and I, and I felt like I qualified for those, but I didn't get selected. But then one semester, some scholarship that I didn't even apply for, apparently I got. So my, my works amounted to almost nothing. But when I did the work of believing, God did the heavy lifting. He said, the work of faith, our work is to believe. It, uh, it says here, it says, um, the labor of love and the steadfastness of hope. That hope is a beautiful word. Uh, those, that first year, that pretty much that whole year, as I mentioned, my wife was uh, struggling. Uh, Emotionally and psychologically, so she was just, she was feeling the intensity, but we were all it was a tough year for all of us, the kids, myself, my, but primarily her. But what she did that year, though, she hoped. And for Tanya, she is a, a beautiful, accomplished singer, and and the way she hoped was a, of a song. There's a song called "God Is." It's by written by a legendary gospel singer named Reverend James Cleveland. He's passed on with the Lord now, but it was just a, a beautiful song of, of, of acknowledging the goodness and the greatness and the presence and the availability of our God. And for nine months, every day, she just sang God is. For nine months, she didn't cook any food. I don't know how we made it. She must have done some care because our kids are, are grown and healthy. Uh, she, she had something, somebody took care of the kids. I don't remember our house being a mess. Somebody, somebody, there was a lot of ladies from the church who came over and helped. She had one particular lady for that whole nine months. Every day that lady called. Every day she called. But Tanya's part, every day she, God is. And I can't say all the words, but the, but, the, but the end of it is, is my all in all. Basically, she kept hoping. My, I mean, pain mentally, emotionally, psychologically. I can't even care for my family, but you are my all. She hoped. And then the pastor also said the, the labor of love. And that she said labor a second, so you, you can see I just switched the order there. And I did that because in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And so I said that to say, no matter what you do, or where you do it, or however you do it, if you do anything, love somebody. Jesus said it was the, the greatest commandment. In Luke chapter 10, y'all know the story, the, the, the expert in the law was trying to trap Jesus, and he said, well, what's What's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And you know the story that he uh, tried to justify himself. He really didn't want to love. So he says, who is my neighbor? Y'all know that story. Now, the theologians and all the sermons you've heard said, well, his motive wasn't really right in asking Jesus that. But now, even if that's the case, I have actually come to like that question. Because what happens is, because he asked the question, no matter what his motive was, that allowed Jesus to show him and to show all of us what love really looks like. So really, it was an ingenious question, who is my neighbor? He says that love is the greatest commandment, and he tells us how that is supposed to look. Then he goes on further, Matthew 5, he says, don't just love your neighbor, love your enemy. And you know what I do now? Because the, I've come to appreciate the question in Luke 10, who is my neighbor? Now I ask the question, well, who is my enemy? See, in, in Luke chapter 10, when, the, the, when he asked him who his neighbor was, he, he kind of actually already had in mind what he wanted Jesus to say, but Jesus kind of turned it over on him. And I want to submit to us here this evening, if you ask yourself the question, who is my enemy? Maybe you already have somebody in mind, but Jesus may have somebody else in mind. You may be thinking about somebody that we're engaged in military combat with. That's our enemy. 
But your enemy could be somebody in your theology class that you have a different theological perspective. That could be your enemy. The enemy could be someone who has a different perspective, uh, 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 political perspective of you. And, and you think, how can somebody who voted for so-and-so even be a Christian? Maybe that's your enemy. Maybe somebody who looks different from you. They have a different ethnicity. They have a different culture. They have a different background. They live on the other side of town. They have a different social economic class. Maybe that is your enemy. And that is maybe who we're supposed to love. Because if we love like that, that kind of love remains. That kind of love keeps you moving forward. That kind of love can take you through obstacles. That kind of love can keep you motivated. Faith, hope, and love. On this campus, when I was an undergraduate student, um, I was a Baylor football player, and so they had this thing called a Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And so I came from a totally homogeneous background, all African-American church, all African-American neighborhood. That was my world. And then I come to Baylor University, and, and everything is white. And so the coach gets up and they said, Wednesday night, we invite the athletes to SCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And, and I can remember, I don't know why I thought that. I just, I just thought, well, they, they're not inviting me. That's for them to go to. That's, now I'm projecting back about 30 years. I thought that's for somebody else to go to. And so they would do that every Wednesday. And I didn't have any animosity about it. I just never thought. It never crossed my mind that they were talking to me. Until one day, the college minister at First Baptist Church showed up at my dorm and said, would you like to go to SCA with me? And I was like, the first thing I thought was, what? How did you get my dorm? I mean, the athletes, they were even fluid. How did you even, how did you get, how did you get my number? I mean, I didn't say that, but I was thinking that. But then I also thought, Man, he really wants me to come, though. And he done, somehow he done broke the rules. He's not supposed to have access to me. He shouldn't have my number. He shouldn't know where I live, but he does. He done did something. He done pulled strings. I was like, man, he must really want me to come. And so I did. And for a long time, a very long time, I was the only person that looked like me in the meeting. But I continued to come. I remained. And through that process, I was discipled. And I grew in my faith. And for two years, I was the president of the organization. These three, faith, hope, and love, they remain. second verse, summer and winter. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in Thank you. 
as you are moving out here, is that you're going to be an encourager. Because a lot of people that are really discouraged this time. And so as part of uh, our prayer, let's just think about it. That God help me be an encourager. And the last one has to do with your connection with the Lord. Um, I was sharing with my friend Eric yesterday that what we are doing tonight, what we are talking about tonight, is not just about motivation or uh, motivational speaking and all those kind of things. We are actually doing what I call a Christ-centered inspiration. Okay, so everything that we are doing here is based on Christ. And so if you don't have that connection with Christ, none of the things that we are doing here will be meaningful in your life. And so I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't help you, none of us would help you here if we do not connect you to the source of faith, hope, and love, as is Christ himself. Because he said he's a vine, and we are just the branches. And without him, we can do what? Nothing. And so that's my prayer, that if your connection with the Lord is shaky, use that moment to also pray that the Lord help me to be grounded and rooted in you, in your love. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, let this time be a moment of reflection and prayer that, Lord, I want to really get connected. Because if you do not know the Lord, the exploit that we are talking about is staying fruitful and productive in the midst of this turbulent time. And I, I don't think you can make it. And so that is what I'm just encouraging all of us to do. I mean, it's been a great time. And my prayer is that you tap into some of these prayers, add it to your prayer topics, let it be part of your life. But my prayer that as we are going through this last song and we are praying, for some of you it's going to be an affirmation of the song. If you know them or the song already, affirm it and you sing it prayerfully and it will be, it be, it will be kind of uh, your response to what, what is happening here tonight. And so that is my, my, my hope and my prayer is that you continue to think about it and then pray and respond very well even as the Lord has ministered to you, you know, in, in various ways. Amen.
and I, I want to say thank you to uh, Bolu. Bolu is sitting right there. Um, there are some people behind behind the scenes. Since last year, I, I mentioned this thing to her and she's been praying about it. And then the one assisting me here, uh, my vice president, Cecily McElwain is right there. Um, Cecily, she was actually not feeling well. She really wanted to come. Um, we, we've been doing a lot of, you know, brainstorming whenever the event comes. So she's really been great uh, whenever it comes to virtual work events. And she's an assistant, um, the vice president of the organization here. And I'm really grateful um, for her life. And so, yeah, um, well, I'll take it from there. All right, I have just a few more people to thank, so there's a list. Um, first of all, we want to thank God uh, for bringing us here tonight and just all the work that he's done um, through Ebenezer and everyone else to bring this together. Um, and also staff and leadership at Truett, um, Dr. Brewer Howard, who's the Assistant Dean for Student Services here, and Jennifer Martinez Ayala, the office manager, they kind of help put this together for us. Um, and we also want to thank you guys for being here. It wouldn't have happened without you guys. And we also want to thank our wonderful and beautiful spoken word artist. Um, Cortina Merritt is an MDiv student at Truett, also a career coach and professional development analyst. Jessalyn Brown is an MDiv student at Truett as well and poet and spoken word artist. You can follow her on Instagram at Jessalyn I. Brown. And Rachel Hall, if you couldn't guess, is also an MDiv student at Truett and a spoken word poet. You can follow her on Instagram at Rachel Hall Poetry. We also want to thank Vincent Carpenter, Carpenter, Director of Pastoral Care at Antioch Community Church here in Waco. And our music team, the worship leader was Drew Humphrey. He is the college pastor and member of worship team at Highland Baptist Church here in Waco. And also Kay Lee, who helped him with our vocals. She's a junior at Baylor. On piano and also helping with vocals, we had Eric Amuzu. Is a PhD candidate in church music and a music director at Greater Bosqueville Baptist Church here in Waco. And on, I had to look up how to pronounce this, the Jimbe, I hope is right. Daniel McIntosh, uh, getting a BM in church music at Baylor and majoring in organ. And designer of publicity and media materials, Isaiah Baba, back there also doing camera for us. Um, MDiv student at Truett and CEO of El Glory Incorporated. And one quick announcement, um, if you minister today, help organize this, if you're part of Watch and Walk Truett, stay for a picture. And finally, before we all leave, I'd like to offer us a benediction. Lord, surround us with your love, fill us with your hope, and guide us in faith so that we may testify in your name. Amen.